Another news day Friday here with the Grand Cathay roster reveal. And in this video today, we'll be doing just that, going through that roster, showing off some of the goodies that are going to be in the land of Grand Cathay. And in my typical fashion of upfronting the knowledge in this video, I'm going to just be completely transparent with you. If you've been watching everything up to this point, you know, you've been watching the trailers, you've been reading the blog posts, you've been watching everyone's YouTube videos, you're not going to see anything new in this video. The only two units that we have not seen in any way, shape or form um, are the confirmation of two cavalry force units for Cathay. And that is Peasant Horsemen, which we've seen distantly in the back of one screenshot, and the Jade Lancers, which are again um, distantly seen in the back of one screenshot, as well as a hand-drawn picture for one of the um, uh, blog posts. But outside of that, we've pretty much seen everything so far. So if that's all you wanted to know, if you wanted just to see if there's anything brand new we haven't seen, unfortunately, there is not. But I will be able to give you plenty of details on stuff that we have seen so far, because this video, we can talk a little bit about Harmony, the uh, unique mechanic that is well, present or unique for Cathay and how it presents itself, right? So we basically have yin and yang. Yin applies to every range unit. Yang applies to every melee unit. And melee units will get buffs around the uh, range units and vice versa. Yin gets a, be a bonus to their fire rate and yang will get a defensive bonus. Um, also, we'll talk a little bit about how Grand Cathay kind of puts itself into the grand meta of Total War Warhammer because they seem to be a very strong but extremely defensive and slow moving faction. So uh, if that's all you wanted to know, you're good to go. You can go ahead and shut the video down. But before you do, please don't forget to like, comment and or subscribe if you enjoy uh, the video here today. I cannot tell you how much that helps out any content creator that you do watch. Um, and if you have not yet pre-ordered Total War Warhammer 3 and you want to pre-order Total War Warhammer 3, go ahead and head on over to my Nexus store linked in the description. Nexus gets keys directly from the developer and gives them to you as well as it's a great way to support the channel. Let's get started here on this Grand Cathay roster reveal. And there's not a whole ton to go into in the initial portion. The preamble here is just pretty much kind of setting the stage, right? Um, they had a little bit of self-awareness here that I'm saying you've waited too long for this one as far as the uh, roster reveal. So nice little bit of self-awareness. And there is a disclaimer here. As a reminder, Total War Warhammer 3 is not a finished game. What you see below is an overview, not the stats of every single unit. And some things may change before release. However, still plenty to dig your teeth into here. Let's get to it. So starting off, we are going to talk about the legendary lords, Miao Ying and Zhao Yang. Ming, Ming, Zhao Ming, Zhao Ming, Yao Ying, and Zhao. Um, I literally just looked at it. And I'm already yeah, Zhao Ming. Um, and we get a little bit of a taste as to how their mechanics work. So both of them, for the most part, have this elemental winds mechanic. So both dragons are also masters of the elemental winds. This attribute, which is shared among all Grand Cathay spellcasters, increases the power of all spells cast for each spellcaster in the army. This makes taking multiple spellcasters all the more effective for the armies of Grand Cathay, even doubling or better the power of spells should you have enough. So this is really awesome in that it encourages you to use more spell casters in your army right because that is then going to take up a slot for what a unit would take and it's always kind of a, a you know not a risk but it's something that you have to kind of factor into when you're using your army composition and with Miao Ying as well as her brother she is a strong combatant she is a spell caster because she gets a custom little lore kit from the lores of yin as well as life and she has the ability obviously to turn into a dragon and wreak havoc on the battlefield so it's really interesting to see this character kind of now laid out before us and as her kind of role at Nangao, I would expect her to get bonuses towards perhaps Astromancers, uh, maybe something with the Celestial Dragon Guard since she is so close to, um, not necessarily the Dragon Emperor, but so close to being like that, the, the one sibling that everyone tries to be, right? She's the strongest Dragon sibling and so on and so forth. So I would imagine her having a connection to Celestial Dragon Guard as far as giving some sort of campaign bonus towards them. Her other little thing here is disdain of dragons. All enemies who try to combat Miao Ying will find themselves at a significant disadvantage. Probably some sort of reduction to leadership and or uh, melee attack and melee defense from what it seems like. 
Now, Xiao Ming, I'm not going to lie, seems like the cooler of the two. He seems like he has a lot more mechanics around him. He seems to have a little bit richer of a story. We don't quite know more about uh, Miao Ying and the fact that all the other warlords under her are always kind of vying for power and trying to um, disparage her or, or, or some sort of... I don't know what it is, but it seems like Zhao Ming overall seems like the more interesting of the siblings. And as a result, you know, it talks about his proximity to the Warpstone Desert and, as, and, and how that kind of leads into alchemy and his obsession with alchemy. You know, he is one of the Empire's premier alchemists and welcomes the same within his realm, much to the chagrin of some of his siblings. So again, I would imagine that is going to give him some sort of innate bonus towards the recruitment of alchemists in his campaign. Um, probably something too with the uh, Wu Jing War Compass, which we'll take a look at in a little bit. Uh, just a lot of things that have probably have to do with that. Maybe artillery focused as well. Um, some sort of benefit to other recruitment, cost reduction, recruitment rank, um, whatever it might be. So in addition here too... Let's see, both dragons lead their armies with incredible fervor, their mere presence enough to enhance the harmony and belief of their people to new heights. Non-character Cathayan units all ascribe to either yin or yang, and when close to the opposite, receive buffs. Melee units becoming more defensive and harder to kill, while range units faster. So this is where we finally get an idea of what the hell harmony is, and also that lords increase these benefits when they are nearby. So we don't know if this is a percentage increase to their innate benefits, if it's a flat bonus to, hey, this gives a bonus to all yin and gives a bonus to all yang, whatever it is. We'll probably find that out in due time. But he also gets his Master of the Elemental Winds attribute that we just talked about with uh, Meow. Um, so again, trying to stack as many spellcasters in the army as possible seems to be a really cool way to optimize that Master of the Elemental Winds attribute. We get his dragon transformation that both dragons can do, but his magic is the lore of Yang as well as the lore of metal. And he gets a pretty cool little ability here, Warding Iron. The Iron Dragon's near invulnerability can be passed on to his nearby troops for a short time. So it's probably some sort of 40 or 60 meter range um, ability that vastly increases physical resistance, I would assume, the way it says near invulnerability, or be some sort of ward save, uh, probably one or the other. So very interested to see how that works itself out. And again, he just seems like he just seems like a more interesting character. But moving into the generic legendary lord version of the two, we get the dragon-blooded Shujinan lord. Now this character is a, not a sibling, I'm sorry, a uh, progeny of the siblings of the dragon emperor. And what we don't know from this is whether or not this legendary lord, I'm sorry, this generic version of the legendary lord can shapeshift into a dragon. It does talk about the fact that they are inevitably skilled combatants, natural sorcerers, and talented leaders. And again, it does say that they are progeny of their uh, of the dragon siblings of the emperor. So we just don't know, though, if they can transform. But it does say that they are essentially the magic wielder legendary lord for Grand Cathay. I'm sorry, not legendary lord, generic lord of Grand Cathay. Um, and what I will say here, by taking a look at our two lord options for Cathay, there are lots of DLC options on the tables here, guys. Uh, so for one, obviously the Monkey King is not mentioned. Um, Dian Ching, I believe his name is, is not mentioned. There's no Celestial Dragon Monks, no One-Horned Ogres, um, none of the, the, the menagerie of beasts that are said to be present in Grand Cathay in this roster. And importantly, too, there's no pure combatant, lord, or hero character. So there's a lot on the table here for future possible DLC for Cathay, and that's really exciting to see. Um, but what we do get from this entry is a breakdown of both the lore of Yang and the lore of Yin. And it's pretty interesting. So let's go into Yang first. It focuses on buffing allies with resolute belief or disrupting enemies with walls of wind. In particularly dire situations, it can also unleash mighty explosions upon the enemy, bringing with it the power of the Celestial Dragon Emperor himself. So the first spell is Jade Shield, which I would imagine is some sort of um, damage mitigation. Uh, we we kind of saw this already with Allure of Ice in that it was a physical resistance buff. I could see that being the same here with Jade Shield, maybe even giving some spell resistance as you're probably going to be predominantly fighting against Chaos in the north or um, western portions of the, of the campaign map because that's where we know these two characters to start. Also, we get Dragon's Breath, which I would assume is just simply a breath attack, fire-based breath attack. We get Wall of Wind and Fire, which seems to be... Um, I, I thought it might be like the... 
ability we saw in the trailer with a quick little shot of wind but that actually might be the blossom of wind here in lit in the lore of yin so this might actually be a literal wall of wind and fire stone ground stance which again i assume is some sort of defensive buff might of heaven and earth probably something that has to do with the resolute belief portion here maybe this is going to buff up your physical resistance as well as perhaps say damage to whatever it is i mean i think of might of heaven and earth i think of uh, something that's going to have a little bit more oomph to it but then constellation of the dragon seems to be a mighty explosion upon the enemy bringing with it the power of the celestial dragon emperor i think that one's kind of uh pretty obvious there it does make me wonder though if we will see more cascading damage effects like we saw with the lore of ice right i think it's either it's ultimate or penultimate ability where it drops that cone or i'm sorry the uh the little blast down and it does more damage the longer you stay in it and the longer its effect lasts so we might continue to see something like that for uh, the lore of yang now the lore of yin is a more esoteric school with the power to reflect projectiles or summon the ghosts of the dead to assist in battle those who practice it can shield their allies behind obfuscation and remove foes in the dead of night their spells are the storm of shadows which Probably as part of the remove foes in the dead of night, some sort of uh, damage ability. Cloak of Jet, uh, probably some sort of cloaking ability, you know, hide allies behind a shield of uh, obfuscation. The Missile Mirror is probably the one that we saw in the trailer that uh, in the in the Enter the World of Cathay trailer when all of those uh, horrors shot their blasts and they just got exploded and mirrored back at them. That's Missile Mirror, I would assume. Blossom Wind, I think, is that circular ability that was used in the trailer too that shot something in the air, or one of the um, combatants in the air. Talons of Night, I would assume too. A Talons of Night sounds like it would be similar to Penumbral Pendulum, like some sort of full-on wind attack. Um, or maybe even like, it'd be cool if it was like a three, if it was three wind attacks that were in a smaller... Um, telegraph when you think of a wind attack it's a pretty long telegraph right it's a pretty long little uh, icon well what if talons of the night was like three or four representing actual talons raking down into the enemy and rather than it being like let's just say uh, to use blanket terms 10 meters is your standard wind well this would be three or four four meter wide attacks that will actually do a, lo a larger column of damage versus a longer row of damage i think that'd be a really cool way to kind of differentiate itself then ancestral warriors seems to be that someone it talks about with summoning the ghosts of the dead to assist in battle now with ancestral warriors i wonder if it will be something kind of like lord of the rings return of the king where you have a whole horde of arm uh, of units that appear and just stampede through everything or if it will be an actual summonable brought onto the battlefield that you can then use to fight things. Um, and if it is that, I would imagine it would be some sort of souped up celestial dragon guard, some sort of stronger unit that can be taken advantage of. Now, the mount options here are Warhorse or Jade Longma. And that's pretty nice here because, again, we don't know if this can transform into a dragon. Maybe, okay, at rank 6, you can get a Warhorse. At rank 10, you can get a Jade Longma. Then at rank 12, you unlock the ability to transform into a Dragon, no longer using either mount. So we'll have to kind of see how that plays itself out in the skills, and if there's even confirmation that this character will change into a Dragon. Moving into the next Lord, we have the Lord Magistrate. And this one doesn't seem to be too unique or crazy of a character. It seems to be more of a support role, giving a lot of buffs to the troops, inspiring them, make them more effective in combat. Maybe even giving further buffs to the harmony mechanic in some way, shape, or form outside of the normal Lord. But he does have a cool mount option, War Horse or Sky Lantern. And we're going to jump into the two uh, Sky Lanterns and how I think one is a little bit better than the other. Well, a lot better than the other. So this could be a pretty cool option here to give him some um, ranged mobility. I'm sorry, some flying mobility on the battlefield. And what I will say I, I like, even just looking at these two lords, is the mount option diversity. Once we jump into the heroes, you'll see even more. And I do like that almost every one of them has something that's unique to them. And it takes advantage of another portion of the roster, which I really do like a lot. Moving here into the hero, we get the Alchemist, and the Alchemist is your lore of Metal Caster, which also has potions. So their potions imbue them with spells from the lore of Metal, as well as giving them unique buffs that can be applied to themselves or nearby units, providing massive bonuses to attack or armor. Now, I had speculated that the Alchemist might not be a caster and might be more akin to a gunnery right um or white and it looks like it's going to be a little bit of both where we get some bound abilities that the cat or that the alchemist can use but also has access to the lore of metal 
And it does say their potions imbue them with spells from the lore of metal. So maybe those potions give them certain bound lore of metal spells. It's kind of hard to say because what I see is uh, as a double pronged issue with the elemental winds attribute is that when you have multiple casters in your army, it's cool, right? It's, it's nifty. It's fun, but it does pull from your overall winds of magic reserve. And if the alchemist has bound abilities that is then that are linked to their um, potions and their potions are limited uses, that might fix that issue. Kind of like adding a, almost like a dwarf runesmith into your army as a high elf or empire caster, which could be pretty devastating. We'll have to see how it kind of fits into the, the actual um, battle map. Now, the next one is the Astromancer, which is going to pull from the lore of Heavens. Again, this does say that they have expert level level uh, knowledge of it, thanks to natural affinity between their leader and the Azure Wind. But the cool thing here with the Astromancer is that it does have the Wujing War Compass that I can use as a mount. One thing to take note of, these little tiny vials around the Astromancer's belt that the Alchemist does have as well. So maybe those are the potions, those are some sort of concoctions. Who knows? But cool to see. And I really do like the aesthetic here of a lot of the visuals of Cathay, like very colorful, very different from character to character. Um, and then you see a lot of uniformity going into the actual roster. So let's jump into that now too. So the first one here are just pretty simple. Some pe peasant, some peasant, <laughs> some peasant long spearmen. Um, and I assume that these guys are just going to be your... Um, chaff infantry spearman unit that are going to be expendable it does say the long spearman and it does kind of have a thing here that says um their long spears give them fantastic charge defense when bracing making them suitable anti-cav and anti-large forces i don't know that's just kind of fluff or if they have some sort of special long spear from what we've seen so far in the trailers it doesn't look like it's anything other than just simply a spear so that is our first Yang aligned unit. And remember, Yang increases their leadership and melee defense when within close proximity to a Yin unit. So they basically will get the benefits of uh, martial prowess as long as they are in, um, well, maybe not the exact benefits, right, of it, as long as they're within the proximity of a Yin unit. So it does kind of create some really cool overlapping harmony. <laughs> I'm so funny. God, I'm not. Okay, the next one here is Jade Warriors. These are those uh, guys we've seen throughout the trailer with the Lamellar armor up to about their eyes or nose region. And we get two different variants, the Sword and Shield and the Halberd variant. Um, we do get also a crossbow one, but that is in the range section we'll go into in just a little bit. So what's interesting about these guys is that they it talks about how they're this very defensive force. And I'm a little worried that this is going to create some tension with the dwarves. Or maybe the dwarf players more or less because they seem to fit the the role that the dwarves do but even better maybe that's just creative assembly's way of saying well let's create a different defensive faction because to be totally honest dwarfs are the only real totally defensive faction in the game this gives you that defensive characteristic by having also some other things but if that's the case we got to get some improvements to the dwarfs roster because they're now just going to be a defensive faction that is going to be completely crapped upon when we get the Chaos Dwarfs, which will have all the benefits of being dwarfs with all of the benefits of having monsters and um, expendable infantry in any possible slave hobgoblin units that they might have. So, cool to see Grand Cathay, really stoked on the possibility of Chaos Dwarfs, but it does leave dwarfs in the lurch yet again. And who can blame them? They're four foot one. But taking a look to here at the noble, notable characteristics of the Jade Warriors, and this is what I'm talking about here. Long trained to defend Grand Cathay against the relentless assaults from beyond the Grand Bastion, Jade Warriors adopt a defensive stance when immobile, making them harder to charge and kill. So it seems as, as long as they're braced, they're going to get a stacking buff. Let's look at this next one. Um, the bi this builds as they remain that way, taking the lay of the land and betting in to fend off the next attack, further increasing their charge resistance and armor. So it seems to have some sort of stacking benefit, kind of like Berserk does, right? The longer you're in combat, the more benefits you get. The longer you're braced, it's what I'm assuming they're saying by um, adopt a defensive stance, or maybe you have to press the defense button, who knows. But the longer you are in that stance, the more charge resistance and armor you get. That's something I would... I mean, not necessarily expect on the dwarfs, but the dwarfs always talk about hey, they can weather the charge of the hardest and heaviest of cavalry and all that stuff. So that's pretty strong, especially in what seems to be. If this is your tier one, 
I guess these guys would be your tier two. But I mean, the Jade Warriors kind of seem on par with some very strong combatants. Not to mention the Celestial Dragon Guard, which would be a step up. And we don't know their variants. It seems like they have the exact same ones with either a halberd and a sword and shield. And we don't know any mechanics that they've got outside of being just simply better. Um, what are these called? Jade Warriors. I almost said Jade Dragons. Um, it does say they are superior to their brothers in the Jade Warriors in every way. But one, they're, they're, there are simply less Celestial Dragon Guard out there. So we don't know necessarily what their benefits are. Maybe they've got an encourage mechanic. And I think the biggest thing we're going to find is once we find out the regiments of renown of all of these units, it's going to help spice not only this faction up, but Kislev and Korn and other roster reveals to come. Because you got to remember that regiments of renown break the rules of existing units. And by doing so, it makes for a very fun um, not army, army roster. We see this present in so many different versions of rosters that go, you know, it'd be really great if this unit had this capability. Boom, here's a regiment renown that does do that. It usually switches up the armament to something that's different. Now, moving into the missile infantry, we get peasant archers, as to be expected, you know, just your first yin aligned unit, receiving bonuses when close to yang units, increasing their rate of fire. Now, our next one here, though, are the Iron Hail Gunners. Now, these basically are going to be like shotguns. It's the closest thing they've got to a short-range blunderbuss. And I was a little worried as to how this might actually work when it comes to um, the actual battle map. Because when it comes to gunpowder units, you really have to worry about line of sight, right? If you have any kind of thunderers or, or handgun units, if they have blocked line of sight from units in front of them, they cannot shoot or they have to be on a hill. So I wonder with the, hand, the iron hail gunners, they'll probably kind of work more along the lines of hand cannon gunnery mobs like we've seen in the uh, Vampire Coast. This should help them get a little bit more damage in. From the trailer, it looked like they had more of a lobbing shot. And as long as it has that you know bigger parabola, I think it should be A-OK. -okay. And it'll be cool to see these uh, working in tandem with the harmony mechanic, right? You've got maybe a line of Jade Warriors, then Iron Hail Gunners right behind them, and then maybe even another unit of range or another unit of, of melee to, to defend your rear guard. But that really adds a lot to whatever the harmony mechanic is, however it stacks and buffs. I don't know if there's more, um, you get more of a harmony mechanic, or I'm sorry, more of a harmony buff if there's more units around, whatever it is. But it's cool that you can kind of layer your defense in the typical defensive onion that we see when we look at stuff like dwarfs or empire armies and have get an actual buff for doing so. So that's pretty cool here. Of course, it's shorter than both an archer and a crossbow, so it is a very short range unit. Our next one is the Crane Gunner, which is essentially the Warplock Gisele of Grand Cathay. They seem to be almost exactly like the Warplock Gisele in that they are different um, defensively, it seems to have a heavier, bigger, harder shield in the front. The Warplock Gisele just simply has like a little wooden pavis thing. <laughs> um, and of course, it is that stop gap in between ranged infantry and a artillery piece because it has a range in between that. But again, it's just going to be an AP unit with some probably silver defense um, or silver shield defense back from range fire. And I would assume a little bit more armor on it because of that larger, heavier shield that we've seen in the trailers. Next up is our Jade Warrior Crossbowmen, followed too by our Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen. I'm assuming both have the same amount of variants, so a crossbow and a crossbow and shield variant for both. And it is worth noting here that they are not a melee troop. It says right here, while not a melee troop, will happily survive and even defeat lesser foes in the midst of a close range engagement. So they're not a tried and true hybrid unit. It seems to be that they'll probably have melee defense and melee attack um, slightly lower than their actual true infantry counterparts. But it's worth noting too, that they have got a lot of armor on them. And as a result, you don't have to take a light armor variant or anything like that. They'll probably trade very effectively into other archer units on the battlefield. The downside would be, of course, that they're going to be using crossbows, so they'll have a slightly lower, I'm sorry, no, yeah, yeah, slightly lower range than, say, an archer, which you get in your peasant archers, who are probably going to be able to outrange them, but the crossbow will have the added benefit of being AP, and these dudes are going to be quite armored as well. Now, going into our cavalry forces, we have the peasant horsemen, which are probably just going to be your run-of-the-mill entry-level vanguard deployment uh, uh, harassment scout fast cav fast cav is the, is the term i was looking for just your harassment scout uh, fast cav so those guys will do your your uh, your plucking across the the battlefield for you now our first 
actual true cav unit is the Jade Lancers. And don't be distracted by this picture. It's supposed to be down here in the Great Longma Riders. So the Jade Lancers are going to be your tried and true shock cav. They seem to be a much slower unit. It says slower but heavier than standard horsemen. Jade Lancers will deal extreme damage to infantry, to infantry formations they crash into. They're also great on the defense, heavily armored with shields to protect themselves further. Conforming to Grand Cathay's defensive nature, they are far hardier than other factions cavalry of a similar sword so it doesn't say if we get any variations of them if there's a perpetual sword and shield combat variant or if there's just simply a spear variant or a lance variant whatever it is but it's nice to see that there are effectively three different types of cav units right we get the peasant we get the jade warrior and now the great long riders which is a nice little mix here and i'm very curious to see what their speed characteristic is going to be versus their armor and melee defensive characteristic and how they'll really kind of weather the the storm here now, the great Longma riders like we've seen in both the trailers and in this picture right here will probably get two variants. It doesn't say it on this little entry, but we've seen the actual barded version in the trailer of Enter the Cathay, and we've seen pictures and everything of the non-barded version. And we've seen this before, too, with with like the Black Knights, for example, have one with barding on them and one without. So I'm assuming we'll probably get the same thing here. We'll get a great Longma Rider, one with, one without. Maybe one will be the shock version and the other one will be just your perpetual combat version, whatever it is. So while Grand Cathay is often focused on dealing damage from afar, anything in the way of great Longma Riders is unlikely to survive for long. Their speed, the power of their charge, and the strength of their armor is unmatched. Such is the strength of the Longma Charge that enemies have been known to flee in fear before they are even beaten. So obviously they'll be causing fear as it's, it is a great Longma. And it seems too, from what we've seen from the trailers, it is going to be a Celestial Dragon Guard riding them. So whatever Celestial Dragon Guard benefits exist will probably be present then on the Longma Riders. We have the constructs now with the Terracotta Sentinel. Nothing crazy or new is revealed in this little portion. We do know it causes terror and it's happy to destroy steam tanks, but we don't know if it has any bound abilities, any encouraging benefits, anything like that on the battlefield. It just seems to be a big badass combatant that can slap things around with its massive Guandao. So we'll have to see what that actually looks like when we hopefully get gameplay sometime soon. Moving into the Flying War Machines, we get the Sky Lantern, which has Crane Gunners on it. Um, and then we get the other one, the Sky Junk. Now, it is confirmed, too, that the Sky Junk, this is the Sky Junk. This is the size of it. Despite the Games Workshop entry saying that the Sky Junk is the size of a warship from the Jade Fleet. So, not the largest thing because we've seen it plenty of times in the trailers. We have a good idea of, of its size. And comparing the two, I'll be honest, the Sky Junk seems better. The Sky Lantern here has these Craden Gunners, four Crane Gunners to be exact, and it does say that it can pretty much shoot, um, you know, unimpeded. So hopefully it means it'll have a very quick, um, not recycle, but it, it'll be able to shoot very fast. It doesn't have any kind of bombs that are mentioned in here, and it does move very slow. So all that in conjunction really kind of makes me feel like the Sky Lantern is going to be kind of underwhelming compared to the Sky Junk which has bombs that it can drop, and it has a rocket battery. It shoots rockets from this thing. So I think that this thing is going to be a lot more disruptive in the air because if it's slow, who cares? It's basically a moving artillery piece. This is going to essentially be a war wagon that's not fast, and I don't find that as enticing as the ability of just having like two or three of these things just launching rockets down range. Because the big question between both of these is, is it a single entity, which I think it is, or is it a unit of three or four like the War Wagon is? If, if the Sky Lantern is that way, it'll be more useful. If it's not, and it doesn't have bombs, and it's just going to shoot bullets, and it's just going to move slow, I don't see it being as advantageous here as the Sky Junk, which has a lot more capabilities um, just from reading this text here. So those are the two flying things that the Grand Cathay has access to. Now let's move lastly into the artillery. We have got the Grand Cannon. We've got the Wu, uh, the Wu Jing War Compass and the Fire Rain Rocket. Now, what makes all three of these very exciting is a little bit of speculation I had done prior in that I think Total War Warhammer 3 is going to be nothing but mobile artillery. And we're getting it. Everything in the Kislev and the Corn roster has mobile artillery. Everything in this roster is mobile. The Grand Cannon is drawn by oxen and not just like in a picture or anything like that it says the oxen pulling it are pretty cute all told and make it and other Cathayan artillery more mobile than counterparts from other factions 
That is huge. I'm assuming then that it means that we're probably going to get some sort of chaos demon mechanic that allows them to spawn units anywhere on the battlefield, just like, you know, with the Tomb Kings and their ability to put a Shabti anywhere or some other abilities where they can summon feral raptors in the Lizardman roster. Other things like of, the, of that ilk will probably exist in the chaos demons that existed in 8th edition and they had a lot of abilities to just go all over the battlefield. So I see that coming here with Warhammer 3. And the Grand Cannon just seems exactly what it's going to be. It's a cannon that's being pulled by an ox. And the cool thing too is that all three of these artillery pieces, these war machines, will also have more support crew. So if they do get attacked, they can stay online longer um, and hopefully use that support crew to displace and move away from where they're being engaged, which I think is really, really cool. Keeps artillery a little bit more mobile, a little more micro-intensive, but a little more fun at the same time. Now, the Wujing War Compass is pretty interesting. It doesn't give us a whole bunch of information. It does say it's imbued with the power of the heavens and intricately designed as a weapon of war. Meteors and lightning storms are summoned in its wake. So I don't know if those are bound abilities. It does say it has like a bound caster on there. And we know that the Astromancer can sit on this bad boy and just kind of read the uh, read like a shampoo bottle like if he was on the toilet or something like that. So we, he does have that capability. A mounted spellcaster with access to unique long-range spells that deal extreme damage to enemy formations, which I cannot wait to watch a meteor crash into my enemy forces. We already know that Cathay basically summoned the Great Maw into the into uh, the Warhammer world. It's kind of been confirmed from the lore that we've seen from Games Workshop. So this plays into their whole dealing of pulling meteors down and everything. But more than capable of tearing up the ground and crashing headlong into enemy forces, making it a Yang-aligned unit, but one with significant range prowess. So it also is a chariot. Regains its own power with increased speed, thanks to control over the elemental winds. So it says, regains its own power. I don't know if that means it's got some sort of special um, recycle on its bound abilities, if it's got its own special wind of magic, or if it just is like a winds of magic beacon that can recover winds of magic quickly for your army. I don't know, but it seems like it might be the latter versus the other things. Very exciting nonetheless. Moving into our last one here with the Fire Rain Rocket is just exactly what it is. It's a rocket battery. It's going to be launching rockets downrange and destroying the enemy. Um, nothing crazy cool or unique there, but it is definitely worth talking about because we've seen it in the trailers. So guys, I am very stoked on what we're seeing here with the Grand Cathay roster. I do want to see gameplay more than anything right now. I'm really hoping that we get that in the next couple of weeks here. I, I just really want to see those siege mechanics. Uh, it seems like there's some sort of ability to put things on the wall or whatever the hell it is. Like we look at this picture, there's that little banner there. And I, I think this is just some, people are kind of worried. Like if this is if this is the Great Bastion Siege, I'm pissed. I think this is just like a generic Grand Cathay Siege. I, I don't know what it is to be totally honest, but I, I definitely do want to see some Grand Cathay mechanics or uh, siege mechanics. I want to see how Harmony plays itself into the actual battle. Um, I want to see a lot more. And I'm really stoked on this roster because it is nothing big or new or exciting, but it is nice to see how this variety is going to spice itself up and work into one another. Like I was saying, all the mount options for all the heroes and lords. I do want to. I do have some big questions about how those lords are going to work themselves out in the actual battlefield. But go ahead and let me know in the comment section below what are some big things coming up for you in this roster. What is it lacking? What is it not lacking? Because it seems to be like an all, a come all roster, right? It's got strong range. It's got strong range. Yeah, I've said that twice. It's got a strong range now, third time. It's got strong flying units. It's got a great core of infantry. It has some great cavalry included in its flying cav, which we got to see how that works because sometimes flying cav can be a little underwhelming. But it, Jade Warriors seem nonetheless strong enough, and it seems to have very strong. A legendary lord it is worth noting though that there doesn't seem to be a distinction between the power level of dragons it's just star sun oh i'm sorry it's just dragons unlike we get with the old world where we've got star sun moon all these different distinctions and how it has different power levels so are we saying that if it's a dragon in cathay it's a dragon and it's strong and on top of it, we don't have the ability to recruit any kind of feral dragons or a dragon that is outside of some sort of dragon transforming character. 
And this is supposed to be a dragon faction, right? So I'm very curious to see about that too. Will we get some sort of unit that is going to be a single dragon down the line? Is it a DLC thing? Whatever it is. And I was also kind of disappointed to see terracotta units. It's not like a monstrous infantry unit as well. But nonetheless, I think, like I said before, there are plenty of things to uh, be on the menu for a possible DLC for Cathay. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. If you have any questions, go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. I'll answer them if I can. I probably can't because you now know as much as I do. <laughs> but as always, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.